Our scripture reading comes from Psalms 3. It's a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, There is no salvation in him, in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. My glory and the lifter of my head, I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. One of my favorite things that we do here at Redeemer is singing the Psalms of Scripture. Uh, if you're wondering why we didn't sing one this morning, that's because we're going to close with one. Uh, we'll close our service this, uh, with one today. But uh, I, love re I love singing the Psalms for many reasons. First, because it's a really easy way to memorize Scripture. But also, I think singing the Psalms helps me to understand that the Psalms were written to be sung. They're more than just a doctrinal term paper. They're, literary, they're literally music to my ears and lyrics for my tongue. In some sense, the best way to translate a psalm into English is to sing them as a song. Yet, though they're lyrical and poetical, they're still full of inspired truth. How amazing is it to think, that, to think about the beauty of a psalm combined with the truth of a psalm. Truth isn't just for the high-browed, wrinkle-faced intellectual, right? Truth is beautiful. And God saw fit to communicate his truth to us through the beauty of music. That's why I love singing the psalms. We're declaring God's truth through the beauty of music. But one of the dangers of singing the psalms is that we don't always understand what we're singing. And this is true for any song that we sing. Who, who can fully grasp the holiness of God even as we sing the words, holy, holy, holy? Or who can claim to have a perfect knowledge of the Trinity even as we conclude the doxology with praise the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Our finite minds must praise God for who he is even though we are incapable of fully comprehending him. But I think this often happens to a higher degree when we sing the Psalms. Maybe it's because in trying to faithfully translate the songs uh, and incorporating elements of music like rhyme and rhythm, it often ends up as if Yoda wrote the song that we're singing. But on top of that, the Psalms themselves can be difficult to understand, even when you have time to sit down and study them with your, in your Bible. How much more difficult then is it to understand the meaning of what we're saying as we're reading the words in unfamiliar phraseology on a screen with no time to go back and reread a line that we've already sung. Plus, we're trying to do all that while, we're, while trying to stay on key and in tempo with the rest of the congregation. And sometimes in the midst of all that, the message of the song that we sing can come, sometimes get pushed to the back burner of our minds. So my particular hope this morning uh, as we go through Psalm 3, the psalm that we regularly sing here at the church, is that we will all be encouraged and understand what beautiful truth we are proclaiming as we sing this song together. So with that being said, go ahead and open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Uh, that's not a joke. We're starting in 2 Samuel chapter 12. If you've already got your Bible open to Psalm 3, well, 
Sometimes, I guess it pays to procrastinate. But uh, we'll, we'll be in Psalm 3 in just a moment. I want to go ahead and start in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Uh, we'll begin in verse 7. This is, uh, this is where Nathan the prophet is rebuking David for his sin with Bathsheba against Uriah. Starting in verse 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Notice especially verse 11, 10 and 11 here. Now therefore the sword shall not depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take all of your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. What a dreadful consequence did David's sin have. Though David repented of his sin, though he was cut to the quick for it, God ensures him that his sin will have severe earthly consequences. He will be forgiven, but he will learn that sin may seem as sweet as honey, but in the end it is as bitter as wormwood. Part of that bitterness was being humbled before men. David thought that he could conceal his sin. He will learn by bitter experience that great sins do not ordinarily remain hidden. In time, God has a way of exposing them to the light. Think of how this promise God made must have haunted David his whole life. Even as he's on his throne enjoying peace, he knows that evil days lie ahead. For God has promised to raise it up against him and humble him before all Israel. And worst of all, all this trouble that awaits David will come from his own house. His own family will betray him. How must David had, have dreaded that day when this promise of God would be fulfilled? Flip ahead to, um, to 2 Samuel chapter 15, a few chapters later. We see that God's word is true. He is faithful, and he does keep his promise, dreadful though it was. David's son Absalom, which ironically means father of peace, has incited a revolt against his father, David. The fickle hearts of the people are won over to Absalom's coup. Even most of David's associates break ranks and join the rebellion intent on killing David and making Absalom king in his place. Look at chapter 15, verse 13. And a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all of his servants who were with him in Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. David knows that his time has come. His sin has finally returned on his own head. The evil which he did to Uriah is being done to him from his own son. He gathers his things and those few people who are still loyal to him and he flees the city of Jerusalem. That city which he made great, he now leaves as a fugitive. How sad of a moment this must have been. Here's David, God's chosen and anointed king of Israel, forced to choose between staying and being killed by his son or fleeing to the wilderness for his life. Skip ahead to verse 30. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went barefoot and with his head covered and all the people who were with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went this sums up David's situation well 
Many years later, Jesus would make this same dreadful trip up this same mountain. Atop the Mount of Olives lies the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus betook himself to prayer after being betrayed by a disciple. But long before Jesus ascends this mountain, his forefather David made the trip. See the brokenness in King David, weeping as he walks, heartbroken, lamenting both his former sin and the sin of his child. Barefoot, head covered, you can almost see him staring down at the dust in shame, unable to lift up his eyes to look his loyal subjects in the face. They were all fleeing because he had failed as a husband, as a king, and as a father. What sorrow must have filled David's heart? Why is it that we begin our exposition of Psalm 3 here? Because this is where Psalm 3 begins. Go ahead and flip over to Psalm 3. Before the psalm begins, uh, we see uh, this description of the psalm. It says, that this is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. David writes this psalm at perhaps the bitterest and most sorrowful moment in his life. While he has forsaken his throne and fleeing from his own son as a consequence of his former sin. With that frame of mind, let's look at this song that David writes to the Lord. This psalm has a pretty simple outline. Uh, it's four sections of two verses each. Uh, it's easy to kind of divide up that way. The first two ver verses focus on David's complaint. Then verse 3 and 4, we see that David recounts God's promises. In verse 5 and 6, we see David's confidence in those promises. And then verse 7 and 8 end with David's prayer for deliverance. So David begins the psalm by declaring to the Lord how desperate of a situation he is in. Verse 1, O Lord, how are my foes increased? Many rise up against me. David cannot, cannot handle the situation on his own. His foes are too many and too strong. David is powerless to defeat them. Remember, his own son has turned his nation against him. His trusted advisors and military leaders have proved to be traitors to him. He's left with a small band of loyal subjects, and with them he's forced to flee for safety. So this psalm is written for those who are in a desperate position, for those pursued by enemies far stronger than they are where they have no hope of defeating them in their own strength. So how then can we, living in America, not under threat of persecution, understand this psalm? How can we apply this psalm? Because, friends, we are in a far worse situation than David. David was fighting against flesh and blood, but we fight against powers and principalities. As David is writing this psalm, Absalom has at least 12,000 men at his disposal, ready to hunt David down and kill him. Yet how many sins seek to slay us on a daily basis? David's own nation had turned against him. He was surrounded by foes on every side. But we live, an entire, live in an entire world determined to destroy us. Everything from entertainment to society to our government, yea, even our own jobs and families will steal our hearts if we let them. If we relax, they will soon become idols and tear us from our devotion to God. David's forces were few, but how much weaker is your feeble attempt to fend off the world's sin and even Satan himself should you attempt to kill them in your own strength? You are outmatched by your opponents. You are outnumbered and outmanned. You are in a dire situation. So then let us borrow David's words and cry out to God, O oh Lord, how, are my, how many are my foes? Many are rising against us. And what weapon did David, David's foes, foes wield against him? They wielded the accusation that God would not save him, that he was alone, that it was pointless and useless to cry to God for help. Look at verse 2. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. 
We know from 2 Samuel that uh, Shimei uses this tactic to pour salt on David's wounds as he flees, flees Jerusalem, uh, bringing his former sin before him and saying that God is against him. Uh, you can find that story in 2 Samuel chapter 16. The most effective weapon that our enemy has is, has is trying to convince us that we fight in our own strength. He is a liar from the beginning and he continues to lie. He says, your sins are too great. Your faith is too weak. Others may find mercy at God's hands, but there is no salvation from God for you. You will never overcome your sin. This is indeed a low blow by our enemy. To cut us off from our God and attack us on our own. If we are cut off from God, then our situation truly is hopeless. So what should we do? Like David, we should complain to God that our enemy is not fighting fair. Our enemy is telling us lies. Let us do so now. Let's pause for just a moment and pray these first two verses of Psalm 3 together. Pray with me. O oh Lord, how are our foes increased? Satan, sin, death, the world, our own flesh. Lord, against us many strong, powerful enemies rise up to destroy us, and we cannot overcome them. What's worse, they say that there is no salvation for us in you. They claim that relying on you for help is in vain, that you will not hear our prayer or save us from them. They seek to separate us from our Christ. Amen. Such was the first section of David's prayer. He brought his complaint to the Lord of how his enemies were overtaking him. But he does not stop there. After telling the Lord of their strength and their lies, he comforts himself by declaring the truth of who God is. He combats their lies with the truth. He says, they tell me there is no salvation in God, but you are my shield, my glory, and my uplifter. Notice the three things that, God, that David declares that God is in spite of the lies of his enemies. First, God is his shield, his defense. They say that you are against me, but the truth is that you are defending me. You are for me. You will protect me. How wonderful is it to know that we do not have to protect ourselves from these fearful enemies that oppose us. Who will keep Satan's fiery darts from injuring you? God will. Who will keep sin from pulling you down to the grave? God will. He is your shield. And who is it that will defend you against your own lusts and fleshly desires that seek to force you down the road that leads to hell? It is not you, but God your defender who will protect you from your enemies. Secondly, God is not only David's shield, but also his glory. How remarkable is this coming from David in this particular situation? Proverbs 14.28 says that in a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without a people, a prince is ruined. But that's not so for David. His glory is not that he sits on the throne, nor is it that he is adored and respected by his subjects. All of that has been stripped from him. In earthly terms, he is a disgraced king. He has nothing left to glory in. But David says, you, God, are my glory. So long as God has not forsaken him, he will not be ashamed. To be rejected by men is nothing, so long as he was accepted by God. God is his glory, and God alone he will boast. He prefers the eternal glory of worshiping God to the fleeting glory of being served by men. Thirdly, David proclaims that God is the lifter of his head. Or as we sing, you lifted up my head. Remember how, what we read earlier? How did David leave Jerusalem? Barefoot, weeping, and with his head covered. He left Jerusalem in sorrow and mourning. But even in the depths of his sorrow, when he was unable to lift his own head, he proclaims that God is the one who will lift his head for him. God is his defense, his glory, and now God is his joy. Though he is sad today, he knows that God will make him glad again. Even the pain of having your own son attempt to murder you 
is not enough sorrow to counterbalance the joy of worshiping God. Even if David never smiles again in this life, he knows that he will not spend eternity weeping with his head covered, but that God will lift up his face and he will look on God with joy for all eternity. More than that, think of the shame that David must have felt for his sin. All of this was happening because of his sin with Bathsheba. Yet though the guilt of his sin weighed him down, he trusts that God will restore him. Sin beats us down, but God lifts up our head. And finally, in direct opposition to the lies that his enemy had told him, David proclaims this fourth truth about God. God answers prayer. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. David does not pray in vain. There is salvation for him in God. When David cries for help, God hears his cry and faithfully delivers him. Prayers are not vain. They are effectual. God answers and saves those who call out to him. So let us pray as David did. Let's pray this section of the psalm together. Lord, we have already told you that our foes are too great for us. But now we declare that they are not too great for you. They will not destroy us, Lord, because you are our shield. You defend us. You are our glory. We have nothing except you. You will lift up our head. You are our joy, and you will bring us into your everlasting joy. Our prayer is not in vain, as the tempter would have us believe, because you, O oh Lord, hear and answer our prayers. Amen. Having refuted the lies of his enemy and declared the truth about who God is, David then moves on to boldly declaring his confidence in God in the face of all the apparent destruction that surrounds him. What does, uh, what does he do as his enemies are increasing and his foes are rising against him stronger and stronger? David lays down and sleeps. He closes his eyes, rests his body, and entrusts himself to the Lord. And then he wakes back up again and sees that his trust was not in vain. God was sustaining him. His enemies did not kill him, though David did nothing to stop them. He was unconscious. The Lord was keeping him safe. Throughout the Bible, we see that restful sleep is often a sign of confidence in God. Psalm 127 says, God gives sleep to his beloved. Or maybe you've heard the opposite saying, there ain't no rest for the wicked. And that's not just a song. That comes from Isaiah 57. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. This doesn't mean that Everyone who is a good sleeper is full of faith and that uh, light sleepers are just worry warts. Right? It's not David's ability to fall asleep quickly that is being praised in this psalm, but rather the attitude and confidence that is demonstrated by his sleeping. His confidence is evidenced by the fact that he is by his ability to sleep. Peaceful rest comes to him as a result of trusting that God is protecting him. Perhaps the best illustration of this is Jesus sleeping in the boat in the middle of a storm in Mark chapter 4. Jesus' disciples wake him up terrified that they are all about to die. And Jesus says, why are you afraid, ye of little faith? Jesus, like David, could rest in the midst of what looked like certain destruction because he had faith that God was in control. So let me ask you, how do you handle calamity or cries of imminent destruction? How do you respond to years like 2020? Killer hornets, double hurricanes, forest fires, a global pandemic, civil unrest, political uncertainty? I'm not meaning that you take no action. Right? Even David took the necessary precautions of fleeing for his life in this circumstance. But there is something uniquely Christian about not freaking out when it seems like we should. About calmly entrusting your life to a faithful creator, even though 10,000 dangers surround you. How strange does the world think that Christian who recognizes the peril that is before him, prays for deliverance from his God, 
and then entrusting himself to God, calmly lays his pet head down on his pillow and sleeps. In some ways, sleep itself forces us to trust in God. Every night we have no choice but to lay ourselves down as though dead and trust ourselves to God. We are forced to hand the reins of our body off over to God, who keeps our blood flowing and our lungs heaving, all while we lie unconscious. Right, and as the psalmist says here, the morning time, when we first awake from sleep, is a great time to savor God's divine goodness toward us in sustaining us through the night. You laid down, you slept, and you woke again because God was keeping you. So let's pause here and, uh, with David and declare our confidence in God. Let's pray verses 5 and 6 with me. Father, our great are our foes, but greater is our defender. We are confident in you. We entrust ourselves to your good care. Satan seeks to destroy us. Our enemies seek to kill us. The law seeks to curse us. Our sin seeks to condemn us. There are 10,000 enemies encamped around us. Father, we do not fear them. You are our shield. So before the very face of our enemies, we calmly lay our head in Christ's arms and rest confidently in him. For we know that he is keeping us. No evil can harm us while we are in his arms. In Christ we are confident, and in him we fear no evil. Amen. David does something amazing when, he gets, when we read in verse 7. But before we look at that, uh, let's review what David's done so far. First, in verses 1 and 2, David declared his desperate situation to God. Then in verses 3 and 4, he declared the truth about who God was. Then in verse 5 and 6, he declared his confidence that he had in God. He is so confident in God's salvation that he's willing to take a nap while his enemies are surrounding him, trying to kill him. But what does this confidence in God's salvation lead David to do next? He begs God for it. Knowing that the Lord will save him causes him to cry out, Save me, O oh my God. What an amazing response. Naturally thinking that his confidence in God should have led him to presumption. If he was so sure that God was going to save him, then why did he have to pray to God, for God to do it? But that's not how David reasons. His confidence in God did not lead him to neglect prayer, but rather to pray all the more. God's promises are meant to drive us to our knees. God loves when we beg him for the very things that he has promised to give us. Has God promised forgiveness for all those who have faith in Christ? Surely he has. The way to respond to that promise is not to say, well, I have faith and therefore I'm forgiven and then go about your day, but instead to follow David's pattern. And when we see that promise of forgiveness, turn around and beg God for that promise. Pray, arise, God, forgive me. Continue to forgive me. Has Christ promised that all that the Father will, gave him will come to him and that not one will fall away? Yes, he has. We should hear that doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and we should be confident that God will not let us fall away. But don't stop there. Let that confidence drive you to pray for the very thing that you are confident for. Beg God to preserve you until the end, to not let you fall away. Put him in remembrance of his promise. Be confident, but also be bold in asking God to fulfill his promise. Second Samuel chapter 7 is a great example of David doing this. You see God making him a promise and then David pleading that very promise before God. I encourage you to read that chapter today, Second Samuel chapter 7. It's also worth noting that it's not until verse 7 of this psalm that David asked anything from God. In fact, this is the first time in the entire book of Psalms that there is any request made to God. The vast majority of David's prayer, even in this desperate situation, is spent not in asking for things, but in declaring truth. Only after he has declared the truth of his neediness, and then declared the truth of God's faithfulness and provision, and then declared the truth of his confidence in God, only after all of that 
does he ask God for something? Perhaps one reason we often find prayer so cumbersome is because our prayers are often too centered on what God can do for us instead of on God himself. Just a thought. Now, as we have said before, David's physical salvation from the army of Absalom represents a greater truth, a greater enemy, and a greater deliverance. Our enemies are not those who try to kill us. Well, at least they are not our greatest enemy. Take, for instance, the four Christians that were killed by the Fulani in Africa earlier this month. It seems like they were in much the same situation as David, pursued by an enemy trying to kill them. Before they were killed, I'm sure they prayed for God to save them. But did God save them? Yes. He did not save them from the enemies who sought their life, but he did save them from their greatest enemy, death itself. Though they died, God proved faithful to his word to be their shield. God saved David physically from Absalom. He did not allow Absalom to catch him and kill him. But ultimately, David still died. And it is at his death that God delivered and defended David from his greatest enemy. As death is trying to swallow up David forever, and as sin is spitting its venomous accusations against David, you are a murderer, you are an adulterer, you're a failure, you're a sinner and you belong to me. That's when God comes to the rescue and with one swift blow knocks the teeth out of David's enemy, saying, even so, all those sins have been laid on Christ. David does not belong to you, for he is my child. Jesus Christ will suffer as a murderer and an adulterer in David's stead. Therefore, he is righteous, and you sin cannot touch him. That phrase, strike the cheek, break the teeth that we see in verse 7, that has reference to a wild dog, like a jackal or some other wild dog. Dogs are dangerous because of their bite. But if a dog has all his teeth knocked out and has his cheekbone, right, that is his jawbone broken, then he can do no harm. We have a similar saying when we say that someone is all bark and no bite. How scary is a dog who cannot bite? That's what God does to the Christian's enemies. Both his physical and spiritual enemies have had their jaw broken and their teeth dashed out. God has taken away their bite. Think about this in reference to physical enemies. Like David, some Christians around the world face people who seek to kill them for their faith. But think about how God has removed their bite. These wicked men can do nothing outside of what God allows. God has numbered our days, and no one, not ourselves, nor a person pointing the gun at our head, can add to or remove one single day from the amount of time God has allotted to us. The wicked men plotting to kill Jesus were only fulfilling God's predetermined plan. How can David say that he does not fear 10,000 men who are surrounding him? Because he knows these men can do nothing except what God allows, and that even if they were to succeed, It would only be because God allowed it. No matter how much authority they may have, they have no authority except what has been given to them by God. Even Absalom's rebellion was according to God's plan. Remember that it was God who promised David that he would raise up evil out of David's own house to punish him for his sin. Even Absalom's illegitimate sinful authority over David was given to him by God for a purpose. Do not fear those who seek your life. Their teeth are broken, for they can do nothing to you except God allows it. But secondly, their teeth are broken because the weapon with which they threaten us has been broken. What is their greatest threat? What is it that they hold over our heads? They have only one card that they can play against us, and that is to kill us. But has not Christ defeated death itself? Does the word of God not say death has lost its sting? Or again, to live is Christ and to die is gain? Myriads of martyrs testify that death is nothing to be feared. Those who seek to kill Christ's church are but dogs without teeth. They threaten us with a sword that has no blade, with a gun that has no bullets. Why should we fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul? 
If we had reason to fear death, then we might have reason to fear them. But Christ has swallowed up death and defeated it by his resurrection. And in defeating death, not only did he cripple our physical enemies, but also our spiritual enemies. Satan, who daily threatens us with the guilt of sin, is but a dog with no teeth. For if we are in Christ, sin is no longer a threat to us. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But Christ has fulfilled the law in our place. Christ has forgiven your sin. What does it matter if you were a liar, a murderer, or an adulterer? So was David. So were we all. But now we are in Christ, and all has been forgiven. And what if tomorrow you fail your Lord again, as you certainly shall? Did Christ not shed his blood to pardon that sin as much as any other? Satan may rail in raids that your sin will pull you down lower than the grave, but they are but words, lies from the father of lies. Sin no longer has power to condemn you or to make you obey it. Christ has freed you from the power of sin and the condemnation of your accuser. He has smote your enemy on the cheek and has broken the teeth of those who seek to do you harm. Let us pray verse 7 together. Lord, our foes are great, but you are strong. Our confidence is in you. Because we are confident that you will save us, therefore we beg you to save us. Arise, O Lord, save us, our God. Wicked men are under your authority. Satan's head has been crushed. The law's curses are dismissed. Our sin has no teeth with which to harm us. Death itself is dead to us. For you punish all your foes. You smite the face of wicked men and break their teeth with your blows. Lord, you broke them all through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. David ends his prayer by entrusting himself and his deliverance to God. First, he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. That is, salvation belongs only to the Lord. No other besides the Lord is able to save. David's enemies say to him, in vain does he rely on God for help. But David responds by saying, in vain do men rely on anything other than God for help. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Trusting in anything apart from God is futile. The government cannot help you. Mask will not keep you safe. Medication cannot sustain you. Your family will not uphold you. Your effort will not deliver you. Your security system will not protect you. Your guns will not defend you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Are any of those things bad? Of course not. And might God use those things to save you? Of course. He often does, and we should not despise them. But do not mistake the gift for the giver. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It is in him alone that we are to trust, not in anything else. David did not sleep soundly because he was well armed, but because he trusted both his body and his soul to God's sovereign provision. Lastly, David connects his salvation to the salvation of all God's children. Your blessing be on your people. David is confident that God will save him because God saves his people. In David's final words, he, plead, he doesn't plead his own merits or that he doesn't deserve all this evil that has befallen him. Instead, he pleads that God would be faithful to his people. Bless your people, Lord, as you have promised, David cries. As you have saved your people in the past, so save them now. Save me that the world may know that you are faithful to your people. What a blessing it is to be one of God's people and receive his blessing rather than his wrath. But notice that by saying your people, David is drawing a strict distinction between God's people and the world. He doesn't say your blessing be on everyone, only on your people. What does God do to his enemies, to those who refuse to repent of their sins and acknowledge God as their creator and Lord? So far from blessing them, he curses them. 
He strikes them on the cheek and breaks their teeth, as verse 7 says. Think about Absalom and David. Both stirred up violence against an innocent man. Both greedily sought that which God had not given them. They were both liars, thieves, adulterers, and murderers. But David repented and trusted in the Lord because he was one of God's people. And God blessed him along with all those who are in Christ. But Absalom continued in his sin, spending his days persecuting and oppressing the people of God. He was the enemy of God's people and therefore the enemy of God. And just as God's rescuing David from the hands of his enemy is a foretaste of that greater salvation that Christ purchased for all his people, so Absalom's destruction, hanging from a tree by his own hair with a spear through his belly is a foretaste of the destruction that awaits all those who are not the people of God. The salvation of God's people cannot be separated from the destruction of God's enemies. If you are one of God's people, rejoice in your blessing. And if you are not, repent that you may become a child of God. Let us close by praying through this entire psalm together. You can silently follow along in your Bibles as we close in prayer. O oh Lord, how many are our foes. Many are rising against us. Many evil people, pleasures, and powers seek to snatch us out of your hand and drag us to hell. They tell us lies. They tell us that you will not save us, that you do not love us, that Christ's death will not save us. Many are saying of our soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But it is not true, Lord. You will save us. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about us. You are our glory. You are our joy. Though we are in sorrow now, you will soon enough lift up our heads. You will not desert us. When we cry aloud to you, Lord, you answer us and save us from on high. Our hope is in you, and it is sure. You're, you will not fail us. Though faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. Therefore, we lay down and sleep and wake again because you are sustaining us. We will not fear 10,000 evils, even if they surround us, so that we can see no way of escape. Still, we will trust in you. Arise, O Lord, save us, our God, according to the faithfulness of your love to us. You have already saved us. Our victory is already won. Our enemies were defeated at the cross of Christ. At Calvary, you struck all our enemies on the cheek and broke their teeth with the blow of Christ's death and resurrection. Satan is crushed. Death is dead. The law is fulfilled. Sin is powerless. Our hearts are yours. We raise our voice and declare to all who will give ear to the good news that we bring, salvation belongs to the Lord. We know this to be true for we have received it from your hand. May your blessing be on all your people. Amen.